Good evening and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. You can find the Commonwealth Club on the internet at commonwealthclub.org. So I'm Dr. Shannon Bennett, Chief of Science and Dean of Science and Research at the California Academy of Sciences and your moderator for today's program. So today we are pleased to have one of the world's leading public health experts to discuss how we can best fight pandemic threats. Dr. Larry Brilliant is chairman of the Skull Global Threats, whose mission is to confront global threats such as pandemics, climate change, water, and nuclear prol proliferation. Dr. Brilliant previously served as Vice President of Google and Executive Director of Google.org. He is board certified in preventative medicine and public health and is co-founder of the SIVA Foundation, an international NGO whose programs and grantees have given back sight to more than 3.5 million blind people in over 20 countries. Dr. Brilliant also lived in India for more than a decade, working as United Nations Medical Officer where he played a key role in the successful World Health Organization smallpox eradication program in South Asia. He has also served as professor at the University of Michigan and founding chairman of the National Biosurveillance Advisory Subcommittee. Please welcome Dr. Larry Brilliant. Thanks. Congratulations. I just wanted to make sure I had my crutches working before I... So uh, I, I thought I would try something a little different today. Um, I know that many of you got a uh, description of tonight's um, meeting that we're going to talk a lot about Zika and Ebola. And we can do that, and we will do that in the Q&A. Um, what motivates me to make this talk, which is a hope, going to be an uplifting and optimistic talk, which may, may surprise you given the subject matter, uh, is that there's such an atmosphere of fear in the world today. We, we seem to be afraid of everything. Uh, a friend of mine, Dan Goldman, who wrote the book Emotional Intelligence, he writes about something called amygdala hijacking, that if your amygdala is frightened, is, is always being pelted with images of fear, and you feel inept and overwhelmed, you can't learn anything new. You don't treat your neighbor like yourself. You don't radiate love. In fact, you freeze down. And I think when we hear names like Zika and Ebola, even smallpox, it frightens us so much. So, so what I thought I would do is kind of give you a little tour through our world of terrible things <laughs> and, and try to find in them the stories that I find so emotionally uplifting and positive. The heroes who you don't know about, the, the weird crazy things that have been done uh, all throughout history that liberates us from some of our worst nightmares. Are you up for that? Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. So if I can, that means I'm gonna try to persuade you of a few things. So first, I'm gonna persuade you that a little bit of pus from a cow might be utterly good for you. Uh, I heard that. <laughs> that being shot out of an airplane in midair might actually be the key to giving back sight to millions. That maintaining, that mainlining coconut water, IV, could actually save kids' lives. That there's a magic number in the Bible. We all know there's a magic number in the Bible. We've been but there's really one that helped make some public health magic work. And that what grandma told you about her sewing needle, it really has conquered a killer of billions of people. And that of course your parents are right telling you you should always drink from a straw. And that, um, I can't say that four letter word for feces, but sometimes it can be the cause of disease, sometimes it can be the cure. 
In fact, humanity's worst nightmares share a common solution, a common cure. We know what it is. It's our ability to innovate. It's our ingenuity. It's our resourcefulness. It's our grit and determination. And it's the inspiration that we get from beating back terrible things like this. So here you have a litany of some of the worst things in human history. They have one thing in common. We've beaten almost all of them. And I'm going to tell you how. And I'm going to start with the, the mother of all pandemics, which is plague. And in fact, there are a lot of different things that have been called plague. Uh, this is a, a drawing of Hippocrates, Aesculapius, the father of medicine, who had all of us who are doctors take the Hippocratic Oath. And this was his solution to the plague of Athens in the 5th century BC. In Latin, he says, the solution to the plague is, run away, <laughs> fast, <laughs> stay away, <laughs> a long time, <laughs> come back very slowly, <laughs> cito longe tarde. That was his solution to the plague. Well, we didn't really know what to do about a plague. I mean, you know, we didn't know about microorganisms. We didn't know about germ theory. We didn't know about fecal oral contamination. We didn't know that rodents might carry plague. In fact, we didn't know how to distinguish between smallpox and typhus and Ebola and plague. And all throughout history, many of the things that were called plague were actually one or more of those things. In fact, the plague of Athens was either typhus or smallpox. And more recently, because of what happened last year in West Africa, people think it might have been Ebola. But it certainly wasn't plague. <laughs> It wasn't Pasteurella Pestis, our old friend. That it wasn't. But that, that real plague, that mother of all pandemics, that killed 30% of all the people who lived in Europe in the 14th and 15th centuries. And because we didn't know about China, we didn't even know that Cathay, which was the name for China, we didn't even know that was a country. Nobody counted but now, retrospectively, we, we estimate that that same plague killed 50% of all the mothers and children and daughters and fathers living in China at that time. That's a real plague. So how do you deal with something like that if you're in the Middle Ages or you're in the 4th century BC? Well, in Dubrovnik, which was a port on the sea uh, from Croatia, they got the idea that if you kept people at bay, literally, if you kept their boats at bay and you didn't let them in and you kept them there long enough so that everybody who was sick with the plague died, that might be a cruel thing to do for the people on the boat, but it would protect your city. And they got the idea that they could do that for 30 days. Well, shortly thereafter, the plague moved to Venice and the Venetian fathers being more religious, they thought if Jesus had spent 40 days and 40 nights, uh, if the Israelites had wandered for 40 days and 40 nights and Jesus spent 40 hours in the wilderness, if it took 40 days for Moses to get uh, the Ten Commandments on Mount, Mount Sinai, if after the flood it was 40 days of water, they got the idea that 40 would be a better period of time and from 40 in Italian, we get quarantine. And that today is our strongest weapon against diseases for which we have no vaccine, we have no antiviral, we have no antibiotic, and we don't know what's causing them. This is one of the strongest, most important tools that epidemiologists have, even today. If you saw the movie Con Con Contagion, anybody see that movie? A, a lot of us here worked on that movie, so we're glad you saw that movie. But, but that's, that's exactly what we had to do until we had a vaccine, quarantine, nothing else. Let's talk a little bit about smallpox, one of my favorites. Smallpox killed 500 million people in the 21st century. I'm sorry, in the, in the 20th century. We don't, we're not going to have smallpox in the 21st century. It's gone. And I, the year that... Uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, the year that they were born, there were two million people who died of smallpox. It's not like this was so very long ago. And 500 million is not a wordo. That's half a billion people. 
Let's compare that to some other causes of death, bad things that happened in the 21st century. The Armenian genocide, the Spanish influenza, World War I, World War II, the Chinese Revolution, everything that happened in the Holocaust, Stalin, all of them, as awful and miserable and terrible and gut-wrenching as they were, were less than 200 million. Smallpox killed two and a half times as many people as all those others put together. And why is it one of my favorite diseases? Well, for one thing, because it reminds us that we're all in it together. This is a list of all the kings and queens and emperors, the most powerful people in the world, who died of smallpox. Think of us here in, in San Francisco. We're living in a, an epoch of new Medicis, but all the money in the world, all the power in the world will not protect you from a virus if, that has no vaccine and for which there's no antiviral, no matter how rich you are. Look what happened to all these monarchs. If nothing else reminds you that we are all in this together, keep this slide in mind. It's my favorite slide in public health. Because if all the money in the world can't protect you from a virus, then what you need to do is make sure that the poorest, most vulnerable person in the world and the most vulnerable place on earth is protected from that virus. That's the lesson of public health. That's the dream of public health. And it's one that we all too easily forget. Well, we had a vaccine against smallpox for 200 years. I'll tell you a little bit how we got that. But we didn't solve the problem of smallpox eradication until we had lots of innovations. We had jet injector guns. We were able to freeze dry the vaccine. You know, Mr. Coffee's innovations to freeze dry coffee let us freeze dry vaccine and take it into tropical countries. We used mass vaccination. We had special needles. We had all sorts of surveillance. But let me ask you, if I show you a slide of, of the innovator's toolbox, these were some of the crazy things that people suggested that could be used to stop smallpox. Of course, the power of religion, modern medicine, leeches, cow udders, herbalisms. That's what was suggested to, to stop smallpox. And which one do you think turned out to be the most important? If you were paying attention, you would know <laughs> that it's a cow udder. Now, how utterly preposterous. How could that be? What could a cow udder have to do with smallpox, and how, if it had something to do with it, could anybody ever figure it out? Well, this is one of the most famous cows in the world. Her name was Blossom. She lived in Barclay, England, in the 1790s. She is the cow of cowpox. She is the vaca of vaccine. In fact, when you're worried that your children may or may not be vaccinated against this disease or that, what you're really saying is you're worried about them having a cow. <laughs> because the word vaccine has nothing to do with measles and mumps and rubella. It has nothing at all to do with smallpox or influenza. It literally means taking a cow. And the origin of that is, is fascinating because there was this cow. She had cowpox on her udder. And milkmaids who milked the cow developed pox on their fingers. This is a picture of one of the milkmaids. whose name was Sarah Nelms. Where's this going? We used to have an expression, she had a complexion as pretty as a milkmaid. When I was growing up, I heard that expression. I thought it meant that drink more milk and you'll have a pretty complexion. What it really meant was the only people who had complexions that were not scarred by smallpox were milkmaids. Everybody else had scars on their face. In fact, in India, no woman would allow her daughter to marry a man who didn't have pox on his face because most certainly he would, after marriage, get smallpox and die. And it wasn't a very nice time to be a widow if your husband died of smallpox. So here we have a cow. We have a disease of animals. This is a zoonotic disease that jumped from animals to humans. And a man, Edward Jenner, who was an itinerant minister, part-time doctor, he decided that he could take some of that pus 
from the finger of the milkmaid and inject it into a boy named Phelps and then take that boy and send him out into the world and ex be exposed to smallpox and that he would survive. We were talking earlier, we would say, I'd, I'd, I'd hate to see the paperwork you'd have to get for human experimentation <laughs> on that one. I mean, is this the most preposterous idea? To, to, to remember that he didn't know anything about germs. Koch's postulates hadn't been created. No microscope had seen. There was no such thing as germ theory. What was this man thinking? He was thinking that he'd heard that women who milk cows didn't get pox on their face. That was all he had. And from that, this intuitive leap, he decided that if you took the pus from a lesion of cowpox that was on a woman's fingers and you ejected it into someone, you would protect them. And you know what happened when he did this. You do know that five minutes after he published this paper, five minutes after the first vaccination, there was the anti-vaccine movement. <laughs> now, th this is a ca political cartoon from 1805. I think you can see pictures of cows jumping out of people's faces. You can see a, you know, a bull coming out of this guy's arm. And right here, I mean, that's a pretty bovine figure if I ever saw one. Yep. Well, I gotta go back. I got too excited about the cows. <laughs> that happens. Let's go back to this great Gilroy picture. There we go. So the vaccine movement began, and I ask you, I mean, out of a little sympathy for the people who are in the anti-vaccine movement, whose side would you have been on? Would you have been on the side of the crazy guy who was taking pus from the udder of a cow and putting it into a boy's arm? Or would you have been on the side of people who said, I don't want that. I'm not so sure what side I would have been on in 1795. So let's look at some other really great breakthroughs. Equally improbable, this needle that belonged to Ben Rubin's grandmother, when, when he was working at Wyeth Labs in, in Switzerland, and we were trying to figure out how to get the most amount of smallpox vaccine distributed throughout the world, we had tried jet injector guns, we had tried mass vaccination. When many of us in this room were kids, we used scarification to, to get the vaccine in people's arms. We tried to figure out something that would scale. He got the idea that if he chopped off the eye of this needle, what would be left would be these two tines. That's what we call them. And if you have, when you eat with a fork, they're called tines. And these are called tines. And the area between them if you dip it in water, it would hold a little bit of fluid. It's, it's called a meniscus of fluid. And he calculated that if you could dilute the freeze-dried smallpox vaccine with just the right amount of money, right amount of water, and dip it in uh, with this needle, you'd hold exactly the right aliquot, the right amount of vaccine to seroconvert to make one person immune against smallpox. I mean, all this went on in his head when he was chopping this needle. And in fact, he was right. We wound up using billions of these needles. Wyeth, in a fit of generosity, gave the patent to WHO for free with no royalty. And if we hadn't had this, we could not have eradicated smallpox. Because this little device turned farmers into vaccinators. You didn't have to go to school. You previously had to go to school for six months to become a vaccinator. So in the smallpox program in India, smallpox had many names. Shitalama, which means the cooling mother. Bashanto, which is Bengali for spring sickness. A lot of different names. So to find every case of smallpox, which we had to do in order to put a ring of immunity around it to prevent it spreading, we had to identify it. And we couldn't speak all those languages. And we, we had 150,000 health workers, searching houses. So someone got the idea of creating a recognition card. We had a young boy named Muhammad Ali, a Pakistani boy in the lower right-hand corner, whose brothers and sisters had all had smallpox, and a CDC epidemiologist staying at his house photographed him and got this picture of him on the eighth day 
of his smallpox, and we printed over two billion copies of this photo. It was the most widely reproduced photo in human history until Stuart Brandt said, why don't we have a picture of the whole earth? Until then, this was the most widely reproduced picture in history. And we'd go door to door, and we'd say, have you seen anybody like this? And if we found them, then we would come back with vaccinators and put a ring of immunity around them. And that ring of immunity, uh, which is now called ring vaccination, we didn't have this term then, we called it containment vaccination. It was discovered by a medical missionary named Bill Fagey, and Bill's grandfather was a Lutheran minister, his father was a Lutheran minister, and he was a medical missionary in Nigeria during the Civil War on the Igbo side of the Civil War, and they didn't have enough vaccine. And there was a huge outbreak of smallpox. And Bill said, how can I most ethically distribute this vaccine? Who do I give it to? Because the normal way you give out vaccine is the normal way you do everything else. You give it to the rich and the powerful and the squeakiest wheels. And Bill said, I'm going to give it to the people who need it the most. And he defined that as the people living closest to another case of smallpox. And only those people, with no exceptions. And like the Maccabee story at Hanukkah, where the oil lasted for days, his vaccine lasted for two weeks, and smallpox was eradicated. That quickly. This disease, which had you know, lasted for 10,000 years, had killed all those monarchs. Had, no one had figured out what to do with it. We'd had a vaccine for 200 years. Bill's moral act broke down all the barriers. And in that little community, smallpox was eradicated in weeks. And we took that, that strategy and we operationalized it all over the world. 35 countries, 10 years, $150 million. In India alone, we made more than 1 billion house calls. And in the end, this is the last case of smallpox in the world, Rahima Banu, on Bola Island, Bangladesh. And I just want you to think about this disease and think about how long 10,000 years is. We have pictures of the mummy of Pharaoh Ramses V with a little piece missing from his chin. Maybe you've seen this, and it's because Don Hopkins, an epidemiologist from CDC, went to the mummy, took off a little bit of skin, and we looked at it under an electron microscope, and he had died of smallpox. So, so we know that smallpox has been killing people for thousands and thousands of years. You know that half a billion died in one century alone. An un ending chain of transmission ended when this little girl coughed and the last viruses came out of her mouth, out of her lungs, and they landed on the soil of Bangladesh and the hot sun cooked them. That's the end of it. I mean, how can you not be optimistic about the world when you hear stories like that? And, and here's the proof. This is uh, the contract that was signed by the ministers of health of 200 countries and the Global Commission on smallpox eradication. Uh, we all agreed that smallpox as a vaccine could be stopped and ceased. And I'll just tell you a funny story. I don't know if you can read this name here. Can you read that name? Oh, I'm going to get in trouble again. I've got to go back. Uh, that name is Keith Dumbbell. And uh, I work with Keith Dumbbell. And my name is Brilliant. So, so one day, we were both working at WHO in Geneva, and do you remember in the olden days when you used to have these, you know, um, like walls, and it would say who's in the office and who's out? You know, it'd say in Smith, out Jones. Well, one day it said, in Dumbbell, out Brilliant. <laughs> and the Geneva paper took a photograph of that and said, finally, WHO's figured out something useful to do. They make Brilliant out of dumbbells. I mean, yeah. <laughs> True story. True story. Okay, we're going to talk about cholera. More heroes. More amazing people. M maybe you've heard of this book that uh, Stephen Johnson has written called The Ghost Map, about how Jon Snow invented epidemiology. I'll tell you the short version. There was an outbreak of cholera in London. Cholera polio, hepatitis, most gastroenteritis. They were not epidemics until human beings began to live in cities. 
when we lived in small villages and we didn't share the same water supply, we didn't share the same epidemics. But London had just become a civilized place. It had piped water. It had the cleanest water in the world. Particularly one company had the cleanest water in the world. And yet, there was a cholera epidemic in London. And people were angry. And they couldn't figure out why. And Jon Snow didn't yet know that the cause of the epidemic was a nappy, a dirty child's nappy that had a little cholera in it, in its feces. But what he did is you can see the dots. He actually put one dot on each part of the map where there was a case of cholera. Now that doesn't seem like such a big deal, does it? That was the first spot map in history. That was the beginning of big data. That was the beginning of everything I did for years at Google, trying to put together geospatial locating of data. When he did that, it was obvious the clustering was all around one pump. And although he had no credibility, he wasn't a member of any big profession, he has no political power, he persuaded the city fathers, that would be like you know, going to our board of supervisors and per persuading them of anything. And, and he persuaded them that this could only be stopped by removing the pump handle from the famous cholera pump. And he did it, and he's the father of epidemiology, the first time anyone had ever used epidemic investigations. And he intuited that there was fecal-oral transmission, although, again, we didn't have germ theory yet. So how do we treat diseases like cholera? I took this photo. Otherwise, I didn't think anybody would believe. Do you know what that is? That's a coconut. And it's got a hypodermic needle stuck into it with fluid coming out into an IV given to children in Dhaka in 1974 when there was a huge cholera outbreak. Thousands of children died. People were desperate. And there was an old legend that the milk of a young coconut could rehydrate you. You don't really die of cholera. Nobody dies of cholera. You die of dehydration. If you could rehydrate people and keep them hydrated, they won't die. So this coconut was used intravenously. This coconut water was used intravenously. And then Richard Cash, who was working at what was called the Cholera Research Lab, he decided that if he could just boil that coconut water and find the powder that was left over and then use it later on to be diluted, that he would have something that would save children from dying of diarrhea. And how, how many of you, can I ask, ever had a child who had diarrhea? How many of you went to Walgreens or some other drugstore to get something called Pedialyte or Oralite? Look at the hands. Well, you owe Richard Cash a big thanks because Oralite was created by UNICEF using the powder that Richard Cash got by taking a folk remedy uh, of, of water from coconuts and boiling it down into a powder. Cool. Where do ideas like this come from? One of the most preposterous. How many of you have had a cataract surgery? Oh, there's more. Come on. Be honest. <laughs> I mean, it's not an age thing. I mean, <laughs> well, those of you who have had cataract surgery have a little bit of glass in your eye, don't you? A little bit of plastic in your eye, right? It's called the interocular lens. You know where that came from? It came from one man and his experience in the Second World War, Sir Harold Ridley. He was an aviator. He wasn't yet a doctor. And he didn't know that more than half of all the world's blindness was caused by cataract, that 40 million people were blind. He, didn't, he wasn't even really all that interested in blindness. But he was a fighter pilot, and his plane was shot up, flying over Europe, and his co-pilots in, in all these planes, some of them got a little splinter in their eye from the, the metal from the gunshot. And the eyes that had metal splinters in them, those eyes died. But some of them got glass, actually high-impact plastic splinters, and nothing happened to their eyes. And he reasoned that if plastic in a shroud, in a, in a little splinter in your eye, could do you no harm, that maybe plastic in the shape of a cockpit or a lens could do you some good. And that led us to what we have now, 
which are these little interocular lenses that so many of you have in your eye. They look like this. And one of the great innovations is that they used to cost $500. And now an organization is manufacturing them for $1.62. I mean, th think about what that does at scale around the world if there are 40 million blind. And that organization is called Aura Lab, and it's in Madurai, India. And they're now making one million of these lenses every single year. I mean, I mean, these are just great stories. Okay, I'm going to tell you a couple more things, and then I'll go over to questions. But uh, polio right now, uh, there's a lot for us to be very optimistic about. Um, polio eradication program has had a lot of trouble. You may have heard that there have been 80 vaccinators murdered by the Taliban in Pakistan. And everyone is worried about whether we will, in fact, be successful in ending polio. But there have only been 12 cases of polio this year, eight in Pakistan and four in Afghanistan. And maybe you've seen these ads in all the airports, we are this close. We really are this close. I expect that in the next 24 months, we will have eradicated polio and guinea worm. It's a great time to be an epidemiologist. It's a great time to be alive when you, when you see success like that. But I ask myself, how did we eradicate polio? You know, how did we get down from so many cases to so few? What well, was a vaccine? We know that. But how did we know the vaccine worked? We know that Edward Jenner didn't do a vaccine trial. But the greatest medical experiment in history was done by somebody whose name you've never heard of, Tommy Francis. I actually only know about him because the building that I worked in at the University of Michigan is named after him. Because he was an epidemiologist at Michigan. And he's the man who ran the first vaccine trial in history. The first double-blind, case-controlled experiment of its kind. One and a half million children were enrolled by the March of Dimes in a study to see if the polio vaccine worked. About a third of them got the vaccine, a third got a placebo, and a third got nothing. The vaccine was proven to be 90% effective. Almost the next day, kids all over were vaccinated. That's what's led us to the point that we are so close to eradicating polio. But while we talk about Sabin and Salk, that we know about those names, let's not forget the name of, of Tommy Francis because it's, it's a huge thing that he did. And I'm going to end this with talking about one of the worst diseases, a little worm that nobody really likes to talk about because it's kind of icky. Uh, this is a worm called guinea worm, Dracuncula or Dracunculiasis. It is the fiery serpent in the Bible. It's in Numbers 4, 16, 24. Uh, it's the fiery serpent of antiquity. And it's a terrible worm that you get from drinking water in which small crustaceans exist that have inside of them the, 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 uh, the seeds for this worm. And here's a picture in Ghana of some kids reading a cartoon book about trachunculiasis, and that is the worm, that green hand on top. The worms can be three feet, and people can have three, four hundred of these worms in them at one time, and they all come out to the surface trying to get water. They come to your skin, and they poke out from the inside, and you don't want to know more about that. But you probably want to know that when this disease is eradicated, one of the most painful forms of suffering will be alleviated from the world. And we have somebody to thank for the fact that there are only 22 cases of the disease left last year. All he did was deliver straws, little tiny straws that cost four cents each, so that all the water in Ghana and in West Africa is only drunk through these little straws that are ubiquitous. You can't go anywhere without somebody giving you straws, like matchbooks used to be. Everybody gets a straw. And here's the person who did it. During former President Jimmy Carter's August announcement, he was battling cancer. He made it clear he has plenty left to do. One big wish. I'd like for the last guinea worm to die before I do. Uh. <laughs> so the Carter Center that President Carter started, the, the first executive director of that was Bill Fagey, who I mentioned before was the person who created the strategy for smallpox eradication. Um, Jimmy Carter has spent 
the last 15 years working nonstop. And I think he's going to get his wish that the last guinea worm is going to die before he does. So I end up by saying, how can you not be optimistic of the, about the world and what we can do? If you see these terrible things, and you see these great people, and these wonderful inspirations that have helped us to conquer them. And, and these inspirations can come from so many different places, self-interest, nature, moral determination, chance. Uh, and they can come from anywhere. They can be high-tech, low-tech, new ways of thinking. They can be advocacy. They can be widgets. But the most important thing to remember is that as bad as it may seem, our worst nightmares can be defeated by us when we believe we're all in it together and when we work together. So now my question for you is, do you believe that a little pus from a cow can be utterly good for you? <laughs> do you believe that being in a plane shot out of the sky can lead the blind to see? That may mainlining coconut water can save kids' lives. Didn't these sound preposterous before? You didn't think there was a chance you'd believe any of these things. And the last one, which is to me the most preposterous because you know that fecal oral contamination is the cause of polio, is the cause of transmission of cholera. N now we know that one of the worst causes of death in uh, people living in nursing homes which is called C. diff, Clostridium difficile. It's called difficile because it's one of the most difficult diseases to get rid of. We have a cure for this disease that was uncurable before. It is actually, uh, it's, it's a fecal lozenge that you eat. It's a fecal sandwich. I know it's preposterous, but the cure for this terrible disease is so preposterous that it's unbelievable. But it works almost 95 or 100 percent. I'm not joking. It's a, it's a serious cure. I, I just want you to wrap your mind around these things and understand that you know, the greatest problems that you think, the worst things we've ever faced, can be solved by ingenuity, innovation, and inspiration. And now the question is, what are you going to do about it in your life? Thank you very much. Wonderful. Before we go to some questions from the audience, I want to remind everybody that you're listening to the Commonwealth Club of California radio program. And our guest today is Dr. Larry Brilliant, chairman of the Skoll Global Threats, who's discussing how to best fight against pandemics. I'm Dr. Shannon Bennett, chief of science and dean of science and research collections at the California Academy of Sciences and your moderator. And you can hear Commonwealth Club programs on the radio and catch up with program videos on the club's YouTube channel. Larry, that was really inspiring. Um, I'm going to ask some questions from the audience because I can see tons of them rushing to the corners and I want to be able to get to a few of these. Um, what advice do you have for any of us who take a lot of plane flights in, in terms of preventing the spread of serious illness. And, and I think what this question is trying to capture is how very quickly we can move pathogens around to the four corners of the earth. Um, actually, one of the things I worry about the most when I do a lot of airplane traveling isn't a pathogen in the usual sense. It's um, pulmonary edema and pulmonary embolus. Uh, CDC epidemiologists who travel all over the world, I trained at CDC, and we would go, you know, uh, in a week you'd go from Atlanta to China, back to Atlanta, and like our team <laughs> travels in, at Skoll. And if you, if you are on a long distance flight, uh, you're, you're very likely to be sitting still and get a blood clot in your muscle here in the calf and the gastric anemias. And there's a high probability that that, um, that can become uh, an embolus, that thrombosis can become an embolus. So CDC did a study of epidemiologists who traveled on flights that lasted more than six hours, and 40% of them had microthromboses in their blood. 
So I would say, if you're talking about personal risk to yourself, I would wear suppos. Because <laughs> um, these compression stockings go a long way to preventing that kind of... Now, that's not what you were asking. What you were really asking is, we sort of live in a world where we have two lines that are crossing. Modernity, which is increasing the likelihood of pandemic spread of diseases. And one of those things in modernity is technology and one of the parts of technology that increase the chance of, of a spread are air travel. Um, the other line that crosses is the tools that we get from modernity to stop these diseases. Digital disease surveillance, point of care diagnostics, better hospitalizations, antivirals, um, all of these things. And, and it, it is a war out there between the factors that increase the likelihood of bad things and the factors that decrease it. Um, what you can do personally is look at the CDC website. You can monitor the place that you're going to. You'll get really good advice on what vaccinations to get and what, what you should do to, to keep yourself safe, which mosquitoes bite at night, which mosquitoes bite during the day, which ones take little sips and which one takes big gulps and what, what kind of anti-mosquito preparations you can use. Um, I think that's probably the best thing I would say. Thank you. Here's another question from the audience. Could the 1918 European plague happen today? M maybe this is an opportunity to capture some other questions about what are the tools that we have today that are unique to identifying and combating pandemics that weren't present in 1918? Jennifer, do you want to answer that question? Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, so, uh, first of all, the 1917-1918 uh, pandemic is called what flu? Spanish flu, right? It had nothing to do with Spain. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why is it called Spanish flu? It's called the Spanish flu because during 1917, the world was at war. And if you're an army at war, you don't want to divulge to your enemy that you have any weakness in your army. And if you have influenza that's killing young men, soldiers, that's telling someone a secret. And the only country in Europe that wasn't at war was Spain, which was neutral. And so it was the only country that wasn't under military censorship. So it kind of just naturally released the information of how many people were dying of influenza, which was H1N1, by the way. It was swine flu. Same same virus we had in 2008. It's the reason why people were so worried about uh, swine flu in 2008. Um, so that, that disease went around the world four times in a year, and there was no air traffic. There were no airplanes to travel. So the virus was perfectly able to go around and circumambulate the globe four times in a year. Uh, the estimates are that somewhere between 25 and 100 million people died. That estimate is wide because we don't and didn't then keep any records of the cause of death. We still today don't know the cause of death of probably half the people in the world who die. So today we would have better death certificates. We would have better diagnostics. We'd have better point of care information. We have digital disease detection systems. Uh, if you looked at Google Flu Trends or Health Map or uh, ProMed or any of these new technologies, uh, GFIN, we're able to find and spot trends in diseases as they move around the world. Um, Fifteen years ago, the average pandemic potential disease, and they're, they're all from animals, there have been 35 of these organisms in the last three decades. And they're all zoonotic diseases. They're diseases of animals, and they jump to humans. Cowpox is a zoonotic disease, but in a good way, because it protects us. But all the diseases you know about, all the influenzas, and SARS, and MERS, and all these other diseases. Ebola is a zoonosis. Zika. These, these zoonotic diseases jump from animals to humans. And um, now we have uh, communities that are working together to share information. We have a group called CORDS, uh, Coordinating Organizations for Regional Disease Surveillance that are sharing information. And instead of it taking six months 
to find the first case, as it did even 15 years ago. We can now find it in two or three weeks. The faster you can find an organism that could cause a, a pandemic, the faster you can react. So the difference between 1917 and now, we would find it quicker. It wouldn't take a year. We would be able to make a vaccine faster. We can now probably get a, an influenza vaccine done in six months if we have to. It was a year and a half before. Um, we have better tracking devices. We have better trained epidemiologists who can interpret digital signals. Um, I think I've just told you all the things the Skoll Global Threats Fund are working on. So you can go talk to that young lady <laughs> over there afterwards and she'll tell you everything. That's Jennifer Olson. Thank you. That's, um, there's a couple of questions uh, from the audience about um, the political climate of the world, the, um, the lack of we are all in this together sentiment and your thoughts on how this might present a barrier to fighting uh, these unifying uh, calls to arms like pandemics, and, and specifically bioterrorism, if that. You're doing the smallpox program and during the polio program. We've had terrific examples of countries that don't like each other very much working very well together. Saudi Arabia has participated very well in the polio eradication program when much of the Muslim world hates the idea of vaccinations. But Saudi Arabia has issued a fatwa making it illegal to come to f Saudi Arabia unless you're vaccinated against polio. In the smallpox program, Russians and Americans worked side by side right in the middle of the Cold War. And 25 countries put down their differences and instead of fighting against each other, fought on the same side. Um, I do think these large campaigns against a common enemy bring out the best in people. Same thing in the fight against guinea worm. We saw some good example in 2008 in, in the fight against influenza. We've seen it in the fight against MERS. We saw it a little bit in SARS. There were some problems with this country to the north of us. I forgot its name. It begins with a C and ends in an A. But otherwise, most... Oh, was that China? No, no. <laughs> Now, most countries behaved pretty well. Uh, China did suppress cases. Canada did um, refuse the quarantine necessary in Toronto for a long time and then finally did agree to it. Um, these are hard things. National interests are frequently at odds with global interests. I mean, if, if you're a country in uh, the, the West Indies or in the Caribbean, do you think you're going to be really eager to report that you've got Zika? and chikungunya, and dengue, if 80% of your money comes from the tourist trade? If you're worried about an embargo so that all trade would stop if a microorganism that is causing a disease in your country hops on a plane, you think you're going to be all that quick to report it? We, we've made a lot of progress. The 2006 International Health and Sanitary Regulations, boy, does that sound like a boring name. That has changed the world. Uh, prior to 2006, people kept all these things a secret, like every country except for Spain. Now, after 2006, every country must allow the reporting of epidemics from NGOs, from churches, from digital systems, so you can't hide this stuff anymore. I, I wish I could say that the bigger viruses of hate selfishness, greed, and corruption. Mm. I, I wish I could say we had a vaccine against those. But we don't. But working together has always been a way that human beings got to know each other well and, and, and found ways to settle our, our problems. It's, it's great if you have a big lofty goal, like eradicating a disease or, or stopping a plague or you know, ending a drought. Here's another question from the audience. Can you comment on the rate at which diseases are evolving, becoming either immune resistant to antibiotics, antivirals, anti-malarials, insecticide resistance, or vaccine escapees, and how that would be a major barrier going forward? 
I think we have a big problem with you know, antibiotic resistant tuberculosis, for starters. Um, I, I don't think we have the uh, incentives aligned properly with the research and development organizations to get new antibiotics. I don't think we have the incentives aligned to get new, uh, new vaccines created very quickly. So I think we have big problems. Um, one of the most important steps was uh, recent legislation to minimize the use of antibiotics in animals. Because the more and more of our antibiotics that are used for human beings that are used in animals increases resistance in human beings and they become useless for us. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't talk about the bioterrorism stuff um, because it's, it's also you know, a, a huge area to talk about and it's very complicated. Um, but I, I don't know if people know that uh, during, the, during the Cold War, the Soviet Union invested over a billion dollars to create a, what's called a chimera, a hybrid virus that was half smallpox and half Ebola. And Mikhail Gorbachev, who we all look at upon now as one of the good guys, he actually signed a five-year plan, put a billion dollars into creating a microorganism that could kill hundreds of millions of Americans. And that was his way of answering his critics who said, Mr. President, you must give me something from my back pocket because the Americans are building so many nuclear weapons. So these are all interrelated, whether it's cyber or, or biological or nuclear. Um, you know, when the issue is war, you can be sure that any weapon that's ever been made will be used or will be threatened to, to use. Here's an interesting question from the audience about vaccines. You've presented lots of success stories about vaccines. How do uh, we, we know as a people when a vaccine would be ready to be effective and deployed? What are the barriers to getting a vaccine staged, ready, and applied, and, and how does that contribute to what we know about when vaccines can be deployed effectively? to fight pandemics? Yeah, I, I think we have uh, a couple of different time scales and they, they don't go well together. The, the time scale of knowing that a vaccine is effective is pretty short. The time scale of knowing that there are no bad side effects or adverse consequences or bad knock-on effects, well, that's very long. And so, and this is true for almost anything in medicine, sometimes Desperation to fight a disease drives short-term decision-making. Um, you know, I, I, for one, have never, ever liked the chickenpox vaccine. I think now we're stuck with it. But uh, it, it, it seemed to me to be uh, uh, an exercise in, ex in excess. You know, there are, there are 35 vaccines that children get before the age of five now. And it's creating this terrific reaction. And a lot of this reaction, uh, you might say, is not rational in the sense that the vaccine works, we know it works, we know that it doesn't uh, create the side effects that people say. But emotionally, I can understand the, the reaction against vaccines. As I said, in, in the case of the smallpox vaccine, I'm not so sure that I would have been on the side of the vaccine if I saw that political cartoon that said that I'd get a cow growing, growing out of my nose. Um, I've got enough trouble with my nose already. I mean, I don't <laughs> want a cow growing out of my nose. Um, but, but there's been a lot of uh, craziness in, in the pro and the anti-vaccine world. Um, and we need to tone down a little bit that, um, that and have really a reasonable conversation. And I know a lot of people feel very strongly. I live in the county that has the highest concentration of the anti-vaccine movement in the world, Marin County. So my neighbors don't always celebrate the fact that I'm an epidemiologist, so I've had lots of conversations. Okay, we have some questions about Zika from the audience. Um, there's, there's some concern uh, amongst the audience that, that Zika has this incredible potential to spread. 
What do you think the likelihood of it becoming uh, a pandemic that affects the United States directly, transmission here in the U.S. is um, is a possibility? And and what do you think about the role of uh, Brazil and the upcoming Olympics in launching Zika into a worldwide pandemic? I think, Shannon, you should say that uh, we have some Zika here in San Francisco at the California Academy of Sciences. Yeah. We, we, one of the things we do at the California Academy of Sciences is ask how the viruses themselves might change in response to some of the diseases and the spread that we're doing. So we're sequencing the Zika virus here in the United States. And the virus is not that different genetically from the virus that was first discovered. And 1940s. I don't think it's, you know, we, we use these fancy terms, genetic shift and drift and reassortment to use genomic explanations for what, why viruses change rapidly. I don't think that's the problem with Zika. I think the problem with Zika is climate change. Uh, the, um, the 80s Egypti mosquito, which for the most part is the only mosquito of epidemiological importance, there are two other mosquitoes that can carry Zika, but they don't in any appreciable quantity. The 80s Egypti, the mosquito, and the Zika virus, they are creatures of the equator. They, they lived only the equator plus or minus 10 miles. That was it. They didn't go outside of the equator. And then human beings burning fossil fuel increases in temperature. You're now seeing that the temperature that's comfortable for the 80s Egypti mosquito is increasing in both north and southerly directions from the equator. Not only that, but it's creeping up the mountains. You know, uh, when I lived in India, there was an expression that the British had created hill stations. They were places the mosquitoes didn't go because they were located over 6,000 feet. Well, now mosquitoes are very comfortable at eight, 9,000 feet because it's warmer. So I, I saw a, a, an article that the Anopheles mosquito, which carries malaria, it now has a sway over one and a half billion more people than it did 10 years ago because of climate change. And we're seeing the same thing now with Aedes aegypti. And Aedes aegypti is an urban mosquito. This is a city boy, or city girl, because it's really only the girls that bite, if you didn't know about that. It's also a sipper. It's not a drinker. It, it, it sips little aliquots of blood and goes to lots of different people to fill up, whereas Anopheles takes a big drink, so it doesn't spread as much because it, it's not taking the virus and spreading it out in its afternoon meal. I can't tell you how badly climate change is messing with the life of these mosquitoes and the viruses that they carry. It's not just Zika. It's Zika and chikungunya and dengue and yellow fever that are all carried by this one mosquito. And so if you want to do something about Zika, do something about climate change. Now, there's a lot of other things we have to do, too. We have to really understand this phenomenon of birth defects, of microcephaly or microcephaly. But, but this isn't the first time we've seen viral infections in pregnancy that cause birth defects. We've forgotten all about the major cause of childhood blindness, German measles, in pregnancy. This is not a new phenomenon. We're just kind of becoming reacquainted with it right now. Um, I personally think that there's s s so much we've been sensitized to being afraid of Ebola. We're sort of carrying that over to Zika uh, as a community. Um, I mean, it, it seems like whenever anybody says the name Zika, there's a paroxysm of fear. We'll figure this out. This is not the end of civilization as we know it. It's not a nice thing. And Nothing could make you cry more than seeing one of these little children with, with microcephaly. But there's been, you know, by most estimates, seven, eight, nine, ten million people who've got Zika in Brazil alone, and there have been 3,000 or 4,000 cases of microcephaly. I mean, it, these are numbers that we're going to have to get used to and to manage, but w we'll get it. 
it's just going to take a while, and we will get a vaccine. It's not like AIDS. It doesn't infect the cells of the immune system, making it almost impossible to get a vaccine. We will have a vaccine against Zika. I'll bet you we have a vaccine against Zika faster than we have a vaccine against malaria or, or AIDS. So, you know, there's, t there's too little known to be optimistic, but there's also too little known to be fatalistic. I think the Zika virus, the, the fact that the mosquito plays such an important role in the transmission of the virus, leads a great opportunity for some grassroots movements, some community type movements to reduce mosquito abundances. And one of the audience members asked how you see the role of these grassroots community movements and maybe using different cultural traditions to bring to bear, as well as a top-down approach, looking for vaccines, developing antivirals, solving the disease itself. Can we bring those sort of strengths to bear on fighting diseases like chikungunya, Zika, Dengue? Well, the one thing um, about uh, Aedes aegypti is it likes little tiny bits of water like this or like old tires that are laying around or old uh, children's sand pails filled with water. And there's a lot we can do to rid those from the built environment. Um, and the more we learn about the habits of the mosquito, the more that we'll be able to drain swamps and to clean things out, as we always have done. Um, I, I do want to mention something though on the top down side. Uh, how many of you consider yourself environmentalists? Yeah, I sure consider myself an environmentalist. And, and I remember the day that I became uh, an environmentalist, and that's when Rachel Carlson's book, Silent Spring, was published. And I learned what, what DDT was doing to avian eggs. So I wish I could rethink that a little bit. Um, after Silent Spring was published and we realized what DDT was doing to the environment, we overreacted terribly. We banned all programs. They used any DDT at all. USAID stopped funding any program anywhere in the world that was using DDT without any care for where it was in the course of the program. On the six month anniversary of the publication of Silent Spring, there were 17 cases of malaria left in South Asia. They were all in Sri Lanka. India had eradicated malaria. Bangladesh was East Pakistan then, had eradicated malaria. There were 17 cases. I don't mean 1,700. I mean there were 17 cases. We were that close to eradicating malaria. Now every year there's five, six, seven million cases of malaria in India alone. I wish we could replay that decision and kept using DDT as much as I hate it for a little bit longer, just until we got over the edge. Now we don't have enough research to have insecticides that are like DDT but don't cause the damage of DDT. That's one of the things we need to do. There are eight insecticides that the federal government are evaluating for that right now. Um, but we have to fix that. We have to simultaneously be environmentalists and peopleists. <laughs> or else we're going to get our knickers in a twist. <laughs> I'm going to end on one uh, last question from the audience. What do you see as the next big innovation in public health or innovations? Well, I, I am, uh, <laughs> I'm often asked to give commencement talks at, uh, at medical schools, and I always begin by saying that I think medical schools should be departments of schools of public health. And, and by that, I mean exactly what it is. I think, I think we should be looking at the environment first, one health, the things that bring us together in the ecosystem, which includes all the animals in nature, the hum humans, all, the, all of our environment, and then public health, which includes medicine. I think we've gotten things a little bit out of order. Um, in preparing for this talk, I read again uh, what Hippocrates wrote about and the level of knowledge of Greek medicine in the 5th century BC. It was a long time ago. 
and uh, life expectancy has not increased that much. For people who are wealthy, who are well nutrated, <laughs> um, and medical science, it's given us three, four, five years. But the vast majority of the increases in life expectancy come from the simple things, cleaning up the water, getting better food, cleaning up the air, public health. We fool ourselves. I once saw a projection that if you eliminated all the cancer deaths in the world, all the deaths from stroke, and all the deaths from heart disease, you would increase life expectancy by 1.8 years. It sounds crazy. But the real gains are not when you're my age. The real gains are in infancy. And those are almost always public health gains. So what I would love to see is a conversation about how do we use our resources? How do we prioritize what we do? How do we value our environmentalism against our public health and medical interests? And how do we trade-off between medicine and public health and the environment. I'd love to see that conversation, and maybe the Commonwealth Club will be the place for that conversation as we go forward in the next year in their new home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So our thanks to Dr. Larry Brilliant, Chairman of the Skoll Global Threats. We also thank our audiences here and on radio, television, and the internet. I'm Dr. Shannon Bennett, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. <laughs>